thankful for you. I am grateful for your time and your effort doing something like this. Find a leader, let them know how grateful you are. I wanted to show you something, not that. This is what I thought of. When I heard your theme and I heard the whole point of this, this is the scripture I thought of. It's not a well-known verse. So, second Nephi 2 is, uh, Lehi's about to die, so he's giving all of his children blessings. Laman and Lemuel, he gives them a blessing. He gives Jacob a blessing. He gives Joseph a blessing. By the way, he must have given Nephi a blessing, but it's not found in the book. Anyway, in second Nephi 2, he gives Jacob this blessing. And he says something that I don't, I think we skip over. Because we're like, oh, that's nice. But just listen closely. He says, thy soul shall be blessed, and thou shalt dwell safely with thy brother Nephi. I wonder if Jacob opened his eyes at that moment. He's like, oh, great. Right? And thy day shall be spent in the service of thy God. He's like, sweet, for shizzle. All right. And then he said, wherefore, and this is the part I want you to see. I know, this is the prophet, not just your dad. I know that thou art redeemed. Whoa. Like, time out. What? <coughs> you think Jacob was like, he basically said, I know that you're going to Celestial Kingdom. You're good. You think he looked at Nephi like, you hear that? <laughs> Didn't hear that in your blessing. <laughs> right? Thou art redeemed? And, and if I'm sitting there going, wow, I'm, I'm redeemed, huh? That's fantastic. I would be thinking, you know, I knew I was great. I didn't know I was that good. Imagine getting that into your patriarchal blessing. By the way, you're good. You're good. We know that you're redeemed. Thumbs up. Good for you. Just kind of write out the rest and you're in. Wouldn't that be great? But then he says... It's not because of you. I want you to see this. You are redeemed because why? Because of the righteousness of your Redeemer. You are, he says, Jacob, you are going to heaven, and it's not because of you. It's because of him. It's because of him. He's that good, Jacob. He can even <coughs> redeem you. <laughs> right? And I'm going to say the same thing to you, and I think it's okay to say it. You are going to the celestial kingdom. You are going to heaven. Why? Not because of you. Some of you are like, Brother Smith, I'm, I'm not celestial material. I know. I know, you're not. Some of you are like, yeah, I Facebook fasted. I did the six-week fast, mostly. Uh, right? Right? Look at some of you, you're like, how did he know? Right? You're just not celestial material. I, I, I saw a few of you, I was like, oh, terrestrial. Uh, and then I met Hunter, and I was like, out of darkness. Uh, Hunter, where are you? Where are you? Hunter, where are you? OD, there he is, my friend. All right, so, he's my boy. Now, uh, you are going to the celestial kingdom. Why? Because of the righteousness of your Redeemer. He is that good. He will redeem you. I wanted to talk to you about him. Um, I teach New Testament at BYU. And one of the things I try to get my students to see over the course of a semester is I want you to get to know Jesus a little bit. I want to show you something that you can get to know Jesus. I was, I was looking at this phrase in the Book of Mormon. I love scripture. Like, on, anybody read the scriptures on their phone? I'm a fan, right? Because I can, I can search, and that's my favorite part. You know how long this would take me with a paper set of scripture, right? I'm like, I want to find every time this word is used, right? <laughs> it, it took a while. Uh, but... Look, I want to see this phrase, one by one. It's come up a lot in General Conference. I want to see it. Uh, it says they fought one by one. I was like, well, that's not what I'm looking for. It says that Jesus let the people come forth and touch him one by one. Now, if you're reading between the lines, that should tell you something about Jesus. He must like people. He must like people. Because anybody not like people and not like touch? You're like, <laughs> we're friends. Let's never touch. Right? He must like people. Because they come up one at a time. And some people have said, well, if everybody took 10 seconds, it would take 8 hours and 14. I, I don't care. And that's a long time to stand there and let people touch you. Think at the end, he was like, uh-huh. Right? That's a lot of touching. But then you find out later that he got to bless the children. And how did he do it? One by one. He must like. He must like children. He must like children. Anybody here just like not a fan? Of little kids, you're like, just keep them over there, a little snotty thing, all right? <laughs> he must like children. How could he? Could he do it all at the same time? Yeah, yeah it could be like, I bless you all at the same time. Now go back to your parents. <laughs> but if he's going to touch them one by one and bless them one by one, that tells you he must like them. Look at this. He touches his disciples. 
He sets them apart one by one. He can do it all at the same time. He's Jesus. He makes the rules, right? He spoke to his disciples one by one. He had an interview with each of them one by one. Even when the brother of Jared brought the rocks to him, how did he touch them? One by one. Even he's like, I love each rock. Each individual rock. Right? So this whole thing right here taught me about him. He is a one by one person. If he were to come here today, I think he'd say, I'm going to talk to you all for about five minutes and then I want to meet with you one by one. And would you wait? Of course, yes. I'd be like, no, not worth my time. Uh, right? You would wait. You would wait to meet with him one by one. I want to show you this. It comes up in the New Testament all the time. So Jesus is walking through a crowd. They said, everybody's touching him. This woman who has a disease that makes her so she shouldn't touch anyone, reaches out and touches him. She breaks the law of Moses. She reaches out and touches him and he stops. Who touched me? You guys read this story? Who touched me? And the apostles are like, whoa, pop quiz. Didn't know I was supposed to keep track. Uh, uh, and, and do you know what they say? They say, everyone. They're like, everyone. The better question would be, who didn't touch you? And I kept track, it's that guy. All right, he's like, hey. No. <laughs> everyone is touching you. What do you mean, who touched me? And he says, no, there was one. There's one. And she comes out, she's like, I'm so sorry, I stole your magic, right? And he says, it's okay. It's totally okay. It's totally okay. He does this a lot. Look at this. You guys know the story of Zacchaeus in the tree? Anybody read the New Testament? What's Zacchaeus' problem? Anybody know? He's too short. Good. You've read the scriptures. He's too short. He can't see Jesus over the crowd. Anybody have a Zacchaeus problem? Anybody too short? Right? Everybody stands up at the end of the game. Right? Everybody stands up at the end of the game. You're like, oh, good. I'll watch it on TV. Right? I said, airplanes are fun for short people. Right? Because you're like, my feet don't hit the ground. All right? Zacchaeus can't see Jesus. Now, I want you to notice something. I highlighted it. Who, he, what? Have they ever met? No, he's never, he's never, he's heard about him. He's never seen him before. <laughs> Jesus, so he climbs the tree so he can see Jesus. He climbs the sycamore tree. Jesus came that place, looked up. That'd been fun to watch, right? He's like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and what's the first word he uses? Zacchaeus. He knows his name. They've never met. Do you get the feeling he knows more about these people than he lets on? Well, well, look what he does with the woman at the well. We'll skip this one. Look at the woman at the well. He says, they're talking with each other, and he's like, hey, go get your husband. And she says, I have no husband. He's like, you're right. You have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're living with now is not your husband, is he? She's like, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You think? <laughs> Someone walks up to you and they're like, go get your boyfriend. I have no boyfriend. You're right. You've had five boyfriends and the boy you just kissed is not your boyfriend, is he? <laughs> I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> right? Look what she says. The woman left her water pot and told, she said, come see a man which told me at whatever I did. Is this not the Christ? You get the feeling he knows these people really well. Well, Elder Bednar said, if he knows them, he knows me and you. He said, you can watch for these, what he calls tender mercies. You ever heard that phrase before? Tender mercies. He said, you can watch for the tender mercies of the Lord. And look what he called them. Personal and individualized blessings. Does that sound like him? Does that sound like Jesus? Individualized blessings. So he'll give you, if you watch closely in your life, you will see that the Lord will grant you Tailored blessings, individualized blessings. Can I give you an example? Elder Bednar gave this talk in, you can see, May 2005. You see that? He was called to be an apostle six months earlier in October of 2004. He was pretty young, you guys. Now, I know he's not young to you, but for apostles, he's young. He was 52 when he was called to be an apostle. Now, usually an apostle is like 70 when they're called to be an apostle. Like President Uchtdorf, he was called the same day. He was in his 70s, right? Late 60s. Elder Bednar, 52. He had a son still in high school when he was called to be an apostle. Can you imagine that you go to seminary and your dad's on the wall? <laughs> right? And your teacher's like, David Jr. Right? Your father's watching. <laughs> okay, so he said, October 2004, I stood up for my very first time at General Conference. Now, let's say President Bednar lives, Elder Bednar lives to be 97. 
right? These guys have longevity. Uh, President Nelson looks great. He's like, I'm 94, right? I mean, he's just fantastic, right? The guy skis. You know, President Nelson skis once a week in Utah, well, except for in the summer. All right, so he probably still does. Okay, so let's say he lives to be 97. That's gonna, he's going to speak in general conference for the next 45 years. That means you, get this, are going to be a grandparent and he'll still be there. You're like, parent? No, grandparent. And you'll be like, I remember when Elmer Bednar was just a young whippersnapper. Right? <laughs> Look at him, 97. This is his very first time speaking at General Conference. To him, it's a very important day. To us, we're like, oh, cool, new apostle. To him, it's the first of, if he becomes president of the church, how many times is he going to speak at that pulpit? Hundreds of times. And this is the very first time. He said, President Uchtdorf, or Elder Uchtdorf at the time, had given a wonderful testimony. And it was my turn to speak. He said, but before I had to speak, we were going to sing a rest hymn. He said, now, if I could have chosen the rest hymn, if I could have chosen the hymn to be sung before my first time speaking at General Conference, I would choose my favorite hymn, hymn number six, Redeemer of Israel. He said, but the hymns are chosen months in advance. And you can't exactly run up to the organist to be like, you take requests right now. You're like, sit down. All right, so... He said, imagine how I felt when President Monson stood up and said, the choir and congregation will stand and sing hymn number six, Redeemer of Israel, after which we will hear from Elder David A. Bednar, our newly called apostle. He said, as I sang that hymn, tears stirred down my cheeks. Why? Because to Elder Bednar, what was it? A tender mercy, a personal blessing. Some people say, no, 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 that was a what? It's a coincidence. There's 300 and some hymns in the hymn book. He got to choose one. They just happened to choose his favorite one. But tell the Rednar, what was it? A personalized blessing. A personalized message of comfort and research. Look what he said next. The tender mercies of the Lord are real. They do not occur randomly, and they are not coincidence. I testify that the tender mercies of the Lord are real, that they do not occur randomly. Oh, I just said that. That the Redeemer of Israel is eager to bestow such gifts upon us. Eager is not a word we use. Uh, what does it mean? He is. He's excited. This is, this is Jesus' favorite part of the job, is blessing you with these individualized blessings. Can I tell you another one? This is my wife. Uh, I worship this. It's this short of idolatry. I am just like, oh, you're the best. She's not very romantic. So when I'm staring at her and she's doing the dishes, I'm like, you're just beautiful. She's like, do the dishes. Uh, I'm like, okay, All right? And these, these are our children and, and we like that one uh, and sometimes that one. Now, do you see these two boys on the shoulders, right? Remember that one? He was like, mm. okay. Megamind, he fixed his face. Um, and, almost, and, so my, my bride, and this is a little personal, she has really hard pregnancies. Now you don't understand this, there's some moms here that you'll understand this. My wife, from about three months uh, along, has a contraction every five minutes until she delivers, even when she's asleep. It's, it's one of those things where we went to the doctor and he's like, this is weird, it's just your body's weird. You ever had a doctor say that to you? Like, your body's weird. Right? And you're like, hey, here's my money. Um, my body's weird, everyone. He just said, these aren't Braxton Hicks. These are just contractions. For some reason, your body has a contraction every five minutes until you deliver. So good luck. Right? So every, we would get used to this. Every five minutes, my wife would go, oh. And we'd all just wait. And she's like, it's okay. Let's keep going. Even when she's asleep, every five minutes, imagine someone punching you in the stomach while you're asleep every five minutes. Oh. Right? It was really hard, and it was wearing her down, I could tell. It was wearing her down. The twins were 14 pounds together, seven pounds each. So she had 14 pounds of baby, right? And she's just like really tired. And she, she told me one day, she said, I had a, a bit of a, a weird day today. I said, oh yeah, tell me what happened. She said, well, she said, I just, I was laying on the couch and, and guys, let me teach you something about girls. They're amazing. Most girls are like this. They're like, this is how they pray. Heavenly Father. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm going to count my many blessings. I have clean water, clean air. I live in America. Guys, we are not this way, are we? 
We stub our toe and we're like, why did you do this to me? <laughs> do you hate me? <laughs> and she said, I was just going through my blessings and oh, um, oh, I didn't tell you this part. Um, with the twins, the doctor decided to go way like really cautious and put her on bed rest for six months. She was on bed rest with the others, but like weeks, 10 days, 14 days. This was six months of bed rest. Now some of you are like, that'd be awesome. Um, it would be awesome if you know, didn't have little kids running, ruining your house uh, and, right, and you didn't have a contraction every five minutes. It was really wearing her down. And she said, I was laying on the couch, which she's supposed to do. She gets um, five minutes of every hour. She can get up, get a drink, go to the bathroom, or whatever, but then she has to be back on her back for 55 minutes. So she got, she said, the timer went off and I was like, oh good. She got up and she did what a lot of girls do. She's like, I need chocolate. Uh, and so she started searching the house for chocolate. Girls, have you ever done this? Search the house for chocolate. There's gotta be some, somewhere. They're like, they're like hound dogs. They're like, There's, it's here, I can sense it. And she said, I searched in all the usual places, but it was all gone, right? Because I was the one doing the grocery shopping. And I wasn't, my wife like hides chocolate and, sort of, and then forgets it's there and then finds it and she's like, chocolate! Right? Like hiding your own Easter egg, it's weird. But I hadn't been doing that. I'd been doing the grocery shopping and so I hadn't been hiding chocolate in random places, right? And the little boys had found, you know, the, the little boy right here, the redhead, uh, he, he had found all the chocolate, so it was all gone. So she said, I went to the bottom of the chocolate barrel in the fridge. There's that old chocolate syrup you used for family reunion like six years ago. You know what I'm talking about? Who's ever gone there? Who's ever taken a spoonful of the, oh, you sickos. That is old, gross chocolate. You guys, she opens the door to the fridge, and guess who cleaned out the fridge? Me! I'm like, why do we need seven mustards? And what is this from seven years ago? Throw it all away. I throw it all away. So there's no chocolate. She's, and she's like, no, no, there has, has to be chocolate. Just a little bit. Just need a little bit. She looked in the fridge. In the fridge is a chocolate pie. She had totally forgotten. The Maya maids had made pie for their youth activity, their, their mutual night. And they brought it over to her. They're like, we miss you, Sister Smith. We know you like chocolate. She's like, uh-huh. <laughs> that had happened the night before. But here's the thing, as she goes to get the pie, she remembers promising our kids that no one would touch the pie till after dinner that night. And she looks, she's like, uh -huh. And apparently that's the last straw. Guys, I'm gonna teach you something very important. You listen so closely. She shut the fridge, she put her head against the fridge and just bawled. I mean, just bawled, just uh. Right? Guys, when a girl cries, she is not crying about what just happened. She's crying about everything she didn't cry about for the last four days. And it finally hit the point where it was too much, right? And it went down. Listen, guys don't do this. Guys do not do this. If a guy saw my wife crying, you'd be like, you like chocolate. Like, wow. It wasn't a girl, was it about the chocolate? No, it was so much and it just, it was too much. The dam broke. Right? And she doesn't get chocolate and the timer goes off. Time to get back in bed. They're back on the couch. She's like, I just, I just wanted chocolate. <laughs> just wanted chocolate. And she said, I remember laying down on the couch and going, Heavenly Father, I'm okay. I live in America. <laughs> Clean water. I'm okay. And she said, upstairs, she heard her favorite bass go, Psh! And she's like, Elijah, that's him. <laughs> what? What did you break? Lots. <laughs> she's like, don't move, I'm coming. It sounds like broken glass. Emergency, she, can't, she has to get up. So she's like, I go up the stairs. She said, it takes her five minutes because she has two contractions going up the stairs. <laughs> she said, I got to the top step and the doorbell rang. Ding dong. She's like, whoever you are, no. <laughs> By the time I get bit down there, you'll, you'll have driven to Phoenix. Like, it's just not gonna happen. Right, so she said, she, she went upstairs, found Elijah, he'd broken a vase, uh, and she's like, I just laid on his bed while he played on me, you know, he's like, his army's guys, you know, it's like Battle of the Bulge. Uh, so, 
She said, my five minute timer went off again. She's like, Elijah, let's go have some lunch. Let's go downstairs and have some lunch. And he's like, okay. And so they go downstairs to have lunch, right? And it takes from wherever you get down there. And she says, I gotta quickly make him a sandwich and then get back on my back. And she said, my phone is, has a notification. So I open it up and, and it just, it was from our friend Janine in our ward. And Janine just said this. She said, Sarah, I've been thinking about you all morning. I left a little something for you on your doorstep. Now, girls, do you have a Janine? Do you have a friend who's this wonderful? You just, I've been thinking about you. Here's a little something. Guys, you will never know this world. <laughs> Ever. If a guy texts another guy and says, left a little something for you on your doorstep, <laughs> that is not a treat. Right? Not a tree. <laughs> so she said, when she told me this, she said, she said, hey, don't laugh at me. If you laugh at me, I swear I'm gonna be so mad at you. I was like, I won't laugh at you. She said, I went to the door, opened the door, and on our on the mat was a pie. It was a chocolate pie. And she said it wasn't even a big pie, it was a one person pie. <laughs> she said she picked up that pie looked up to heaven and said, you're the best. <laughs> and she went in and she said, for just two minutes, I had relief. Just for two minutes, I had relief. Now some people would say that was what? It's coincidence. It was a coincidence. What would Elder Bednar say? He would say, the tender mercies of the Lord are real. They do not occur randomly or merely by coincidence. You guys, I have hundreds of these stories. The Lord is very active in people's lives. This is a lady named Elaine Jolt. You've ever heard of Elaine? She used to be the general young women's president of the church. I'm going to tell you a quick story. When she was 12 years old, she's a lot older than she looks, by the way. <laughs> right? this, she's Probably like she over like 70. I mean, she is old. Now, it, they doll these pictures up, I think. All right. They want the general authorities. Like, you look healthy. All right. So, a little Photoshop to make you look healthier. All right. So, um... She, uh, she said, okay, okay, let me get this straight. She said, when I was in Young Women's and we did personal progress, you didn't get a medallion, you got a sash. But it's called, not a sash, it's called a, the thing in Boy Scouts. What? Vandalo. None of you said that, I just thought of that. Vandalo. <laughs> it's called a vandalo. And when you would earn a value, girls, instead of getting like, you know, a, a ribbon or something, they would get a patch, like Boy Scouts. And she said, when you turned 12 and you entered Young Women's, they gave you a bandolo, but in our stake, I don't know if they did this in the whole church, but she said, in our stake, you chose a symbol. And they put it at the top of the bandolo, and that meant it was yours. She said, so here I am, 12 years old, I'm going into Young Women's, and I fasted and prayed. And she's like, Lord, what should my symbol be? And she finally settled on a white rose. She's like, that'll be my symbol, a white rose. So when she got her bandolo and she turned 12, guess what her leaders had done? They had sewn a white rose at the top and everyone knew for the next six years, that's Elaine's bandolo because it has a white rose at the top. Everyone, she said, my best friend chose the blue bird of happiness, right? There was a little blue bird on there. She said, so mine was the white rose and I was known for the white rose. She said, but when I turned 18, the, the bandolo went in my hope chest and I went off to college. And then she said something, by the way, just on a side note, can I just tell you what she said? She goes, we were on that airplane, and she said, Hank, the commandments gave me a great life. Isn't that funny? Some of us look at commandments, we're like, that's where happiness <coughs> goes to die. Uh, <laughs> how does she see commandments? She's like, the commandments gave me a great life. Isn't that amazing? The commandments gave me a great life. Anyway, she said, and the best thing that could happen to a person happened to me. I said, well, what's that? She said, I have a grandmother. She was like, I was so happy. I was a grandma, and that's all I ever, I, she said, I just love being a grandma. One day, she said, I was kneading dough, right? Perfect grandma. Kneading <laughs> dough. Uh, and she said, um, the phone rang. So I her, her, grabbed it and stuck it on my arm so I wouldn't get it all doughy. And she's like, hello, kneading her dough. And the guy on the other line said, um, Elaine Dalton, please. She's like, speaking. And uh, we had to do this with a landline. It's primitive. All right, so then the guy said, Sister Dalton, my name is Michael Johansson, and I am the uh, secretary to President Thomas S. Monson. 
Um, he is hoping that you and your husband could come meet with him tomorrow. Would you be available between 10 and 10.30 to squeeze in some time with President Monson? <laughs> and she's like, what? <laughs> huh? And he's like, would you be able, she's like, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And he's like, okay, this is where you need to park. This is where she's like, uh -huh, whatever, okay. She said, he went, he said goodbye, and it clicked, and so she just dropped the phone. <laughs> All right, she's like, her husband comes in, because she heard the phone drop, he's like, what's the problem? She said, we have a meeting with President Monson tomorrow at 10, 15. Husbands are awesome. I love husbands, I am one. Sometimes husbands drop the ball. Your wife is about to meet with President Monson, and his, <laughs> her husband looks at her and goes, whoa, what'd you do? <laughs> Serious? What did you do? As if President Monson just meets with rogue sisters every day. That's she wore what? I want her in here at 10:15. Now she said we showed up. He's so nice. She's like he was so nice to us. He, he talked about growing up in Salt Lake, and, and he, my husband had grown up in Salt Lake, so they swapped some stories. And, and then he said we sat down, and there was three chairs there, and he reached across and he grabbed my hand and he started to weep. And he said, Sister Dalton, uh, the First Presidency prays for the young women of the church daily. And the Lord is very mindful of them. And Sister Dalton, the Lord has called you to preside over the young women's program for the next three years. And she was like, huh? She said, hey, I did not see that coming. She said, all of a sudden this voice started in my head. Say no. Say no. Say no, you can't do this, you're just a grandma. You were just a grandma, say no, you're gonna ruin the church. <laughs> say no, say no. And she said, out of my mouth came, yes, yes. And the voice was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> say no, you're gonna ruin it. Joseph Smith brought it up, Elaine Dalton's bringing it down. <laughs> you're gonna ruin everything. You are gonna ruin everything. And she's like, he's letting us out of the office. And I'm like, in a daze, uh huh, uh huh, I can't do this. She said, Hank, I hate two things, traveling and talking. Guess what this job is? Traveling and talking. She's like, I'm, she said, we got halfway down the hall and I'm supposed to feel really good. She's like, I did not feel good. I didn't, this is bad, this is really bad. <laughs> then she said, out of President Monson's office comes President Monson's head. And he's like, Sister Dalton, Brother Dalton, come back. And she's like, oh no, he knows, <laughs> right? The angel was like, get her. <laughs> Show her on the church. <laughs> so she's like, I went back. She said, but his, when I got to his office, it was just open. It wasn't like, he wasn't there. And so I kind of stuck my head in and he was over against the window and he was getting something at the window and he walked it over to me and he said, I forgot to give you this for the beautiful sister. And she looked down and she's like, oh, thank you, President Watson. And she grabbed it from him and she turned and went to her husband. He said, what was that about? And she's like, oh, he just wanted to give me this white rose. She said, I just sat there in that hallway and stared at this white rose. And she said, I took it home. I took that precious rose home. I put it in a beautiful crystal vase and placed it on a table where I could see it every day. Now, some people say that was what? It's coincidence. What would Ella Bednar say? Tender mercies of the Lord are real. The tender mercies of the Lord are real. Oh, you want to hear this one? So... <laughs> You're like, yeah, all right. So this lady, I gave this, I gave a similar talk up in Idaho. And this lady said, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. She came up to me and you know, it's a good story when they already start crying before they start. Right. She's like, I got it. Right. And I was like, wow. All right. So she said, she said, this is a true story. What I'm about to tell you is a true story. And you're, you're not going to think it's not a true story, but I, I might get it. It's a true story. She said, it's a true story. She said, my son is kind of a homebody. He just likes home. Anybody like this? They just like home. Anybody like, I like home. And she said, he's just always been this way. He's always, of my kids, he's just like, I'll stay home. I like home. Home is nice. <laughs> right? I like my family. I like home. And she said, and he got called on a mission to Poland. And that wasn't home. He's like, he wanted Boise, which was about an hour away. Right? <laughs> he was like, I just don't want to go away from home. And he said, she said it was really hard for him. Like it was a true test of his faith. 
that he went to the MTC, and he was there for a month or two, right? And then he got on the airplane in Salt Lake, and he's going to fly for the first time in his life across the ocean to Poland. She said he got on the plane, and somewhere between Salt Lake and his first connection in New York City, he decides he's not doing it. He's going home. Somewhere in that airplane ride, he was like, I cannot do this. He had a little anxiety, started panicking. I gotta be home. He said he landed in New York City. Now, I don't know if you've traveled much, but if you've ever been to New York City at the airport, it's insane. All right, it's just, it's so busy, it's so crazy, and people are not nice. Uh, and I've traveled there a bunch of times, and I've never met someone nice. Uh, right? Just kidding, but you get, you get the picture. So he said he got off the plane and walked straight to the first counter he found. Now, if you've ever been, if you've ever been traveling and there's a lot of people and there's two people working at these counters and they're not nice, have you ever done this before? You wait in line, you wait in line, and you kind of step a foot every couple hours. Uh, and, and then when you eventually get to the line, they're like, name. I mean, that's the first thing. You're like, well, I'm kind of stuck in here. Name. Uh, your name or my name? Right? I'm, it's really hard. She said, uh, he said he waited in line, waited in line, and he went to the very first counter he saw. This is New York City. This is not Utah. He walks up and he said, I need to change my itinerary. And she said, name. And he's like, you gave her a name. His name, not her name. And she said, okay, what are we doing? And he said, I need to go back to New York, or back to Salt Lake City. And she said, well, let me look at your itinerary. And he's supposed to land in Poland. <laughs> She's like, what's going on? And she finally looked up and she goes, oh, you're a missionary. Are you coming or going? He's like, it's complicated. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean it's complicated? He started to cry. I just need to go home, okay? She said, where are you going on your mission? He said, I'm going to Poland. There's only one mission there. Well, there was at the time. He said, she said, this is a true story, just so you know. She said, wow. My son is the AP in that mission. And I have the mission president's phone number in my phone. Should we go call him? He's like, yeah, sure. So they found a little room and she said, I called him and I said, hello president. This is the woman. Hello president. I'm not calling for my son. How's he doing? Don't tell me. How's he doing? I don't want to tell Is he there? No, 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 never mind. She said, president, I have a friend of yours here in the airport in New York City. I think he'd like to talk to you. Gets on the phone. They start talking, and the mission friend's like, I know you're scared, Elder. I know you're scared. I was scared, too. I was scared, too. You get on that plane, Elder. I will take care of you. I promise I will take care of you. And he's like, okay. Okay. Right? I got that. Right? And he flies to Poland. But the, the woman telling me this story is his mother. And she said, he's now the AP to that mission president. And he's coming home in two months. Do you know how hard it is to find a Mormon in New York City? When you want to? Do you know how random it is that he would run into the one gate agent in New York City that's a Mormon? And not only that she's a Mormon, but she has a son serving a mission. And not only does she have a son serving a mission, but it's the same mission. Some people would call that a coincidence. Some stupid people would call that a coincidence. How about this one? True story. All of these are true. You ready for this? You must, some of you might have heard this one. This made, made national news. Mormon missionary in Ghana. Anybody hear this? Is it ringing a bell? Mormon missionary in Ghana. He'd been there like three months, and he said the uh, adventure had worn off. <laughs> He's like, for the first three months, you're like, wow, I gotta go down to the river to get water. <laughs> it's like camping. <laughs> And then after three months, he's like, this is like camping. <laughs> like, this is not fun. And he started to wonder if he could really do it. He said, the worst part, he said, my lowest part was I'm sitting on a bus in Ghana and someone handed me a goat. <laughs> they didn't have room for it. So they're like, here, hold this. And he said, this goat is just breathing on my face. <laughs> he's like, oh goodness, what am I doing here? He said, we got off. A couple days later, we're sitting on a, a bench and we're talking with some people and he just is like, Lord, I don't know if this is good right for me. I get, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm not just homesick, I'm United States sick. Like, 
Can you, is there anything here? I, I could use, you know, whatever, I could use uh, music, something, something from America. And she, he said, all of a sudden, this kid walks by in a Utah jazz jersey. And he's like, hey, Ken, you, green, jerk. Me? Said, Come here. The kid walks over to him and he goes, hey, that's my favorite team. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and he's like, that's fantastic. And he was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. He said the kid turned around and walked away and he could see writing on the inside of the jersey. And he's like, hey, come here. Take that off. And the kid's like, what? Is Mormon missionaries steal my clothes? <laughs> he said the kid took off his jersey and handed it to him. He said on the inside, in my 10-year-old handwriting, is my name. It, my jersey I had donated when I was 10. He's like, this is mine. The kid's like, no, it's not. <laughs> He's like, no, I don't want it. Just let me get a picture of you. Some people would say that was coincidence. This is Alicia. Her family calls her Mutz. That's a strange story. Alicia Mutz Rosenbrook is the only female bear hunting guide in Alaska. She's also a member of the church. She's a professional bear hunting guide. Now, if you don't like hunting, if you're someone who's like anti-hunting, you should probably look at your feet because I'm going to show you a hunting picture. All right? Some of you hate it, and that's okay. I'm not saying it's awesome and wonderful. I just want to show you the picture. This is what Alicia hunts. Again, if you don't like hunting, look away. This is what Alicia hunts. This is her husband and her son. This is what she hunts in Alaska. Alicia told me this story. Those of you who look down, you can look up now. Alicia told me this story. She said, Hank, bear hunting is a dangerous thing. I was like, is that? <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> she said, it's a dangerous thing. And so when you take people out bear hunting, you have to be very careful with them. It's not like deer hunting. You, hit, you wound a deer, it runs away. You wound a bear, it looks for whatever hurt it. And if it sees you, it will kill you. She said, so you, you have to be careful. She said, you have a dog with you at all times, so the dog will distract the bear just in case. He can follow him, you can track him, right? And so he has a little, she has a little dog, a little like yappy, mean thing. Uh, what's its name? What's its Whoa. name? Its name is not Pomeranian. <laughs> Who invited that girl? All right. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, girl. I like you. You're great. You're great. Don't be mad. Don't leave. <laughs> oh, you guys, I, we'll just have to choose a name. We'll call it uh, Jerem. Jerem. I'm holding three things at once. <laughs> Watch, watch what I'm going to do here. Hang on, hang on. I'm going to look it up. I'll tell you to stop. Stop it, you weirdos. Okay. So I'll tell you the story. Now I'm going to get the name. It's looking it up right now. Siri's the best. All right. So she said, um, imagine my surprise when I take the president of the Boy Scouts on a hunting trip and my job is to protect him. He comes over to me and randomly says, Alicia, I have been prompted by God. He's not a member of the church. I've been prompted by God to tell you that you need to be more careful when you go after a wounded bear. She's like, what? He said, I just feel like God wants you to hear this. And she's like, she, first she was offended, right? Some man is telling me how to do my job. I'm the only female hunting guide in the state. You think I need your help? <laughs> but she said, I tried to be humble about it and said, okay, thanks. And then she said, it was weird. But she said, going out hunting two weeks later with a different person, we wounded a bear. She said, he went into the woods. She said, if this was, I just knew what to do. I send the dog in, right? And when I hear him, I go in after him. Uh, and I go and, and I go find this bear. Well, guys, kill me. I can't find it. 
don't don't give me advice. <laughs> All right, so. Some things I should go over, Whitney. I should go over. Whitney. That's what we'll call the dog. Whitney. So, <laughs> so it's a boy. It's a weird name for a boy dog. <laughs> so she says Whitney runs in, and not 50 yards away is this bear, and it's sitting there. And he, she said, now when a wounded bear sees the dog, he'll start looking around. Now you can tell within seconds, she said, of what he'll do. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this. She said, as she stepped into the woods, she thought about that prompting that guy had had. And so she took her backpack off. She said, that's total against what I would normally do. I would never take my backpack off. So she's like, I took my backpack off. And I went a little more carefully. And then she said, I took a number, a couple more steps, and I took my gun off safety. She said, both of those. You never do those things. But I was just being a little bit more careful this time. She said, I took my gun off safety. And she said, Whitney had, had this, this bear. And she said, within seconds, you know if a bear is going to fight or fight. And she said, I knew in seconds what this thing was going to do. Because its ears went back when it saw me, and it bounded right at me. And I don't know if you know how fast a bear is. A bear is faster than a horse. All right? They have one big grabbing paw. And they'll grab at the ground, and they'll mow you down. And she's like, she said, everything went into slow motion. This bear is coming right at me. She said, my gun was off safety. I loaded him. Now, those of you who hunt, she said, I loaded him with five 50 caliber shots. And he kept coming. She said, my sixth shot hit him. And he landed and skidded three feet from my feet. She said, without a brave little dog, because the dog was just holding the bear up long enough to get her so she could get those shots off, without a brave little dog and some random man telling me that I should be more careful. Now, you would say, oh, that was a nice coincidence, right? That's not. All right, we're going to skip that one. I have so many stories to tell you, but I don't know what time it is. What time is it? Oh, okay, i got to hurry, huh? All right. This is my favorite one. This is my favorite one. Now, I've only told you a couple, and I wish we had all night, I'd tell you hundreds, but you'd be bored, and I would have fun. All right, so here, I'm gonna finish with my favorite one. The man on the right, true story, is John Eco Mensa. When John Eco Mensa, in 1991, before you were born, 1900s, was painting a garage in Nakaka, Ghana. He's painting a garage. This woman who he's painting the garage for is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Apparently, she likes to hire non-members to do work for her, and then she just talks to them about the church the whole time. And they don't leave because they want to get paid. This is a new missionary technique, right? That we can use. She, he said, she just sat outside watching me paint. John, what church do you go to? He's like, I don't go to church. Why not? I don't believe in God. Oh, that's too bad. She said, John, God believes in you. <laughs> He's like, thank you. He said, no, I'm not interested. And she said, oh, that's too bad. I was going to have you paint my fence. But if you're not interested, we'll get someone else. He's like, what time's church? <laughs> she, he said he went to church with this lady. He figured it was worth the work. So he showed up to church. And he said, for the first time in many, many years, I was not angry for three whole hours. He said that had not happened in a long time. I was not angry for three whole hours. He liked the feeling of not being angry. So he went back the next week with her and she gave him more work. And he went back the third week with her. And you know the story. John E. Comensa in 1991 joins the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Fast forward, it's 2012. Not right now, it's 2018. 2012 in our story. He's now, he's been a member of the church for 21 years. He's fully baked. He's fully Mormon. <laughs> he goes to the temple every six months because he has to save up his money, just like you and me have to save up our money so we can get to the temple every six months, you know, because it's like so far away. Uh, that was supposed to make you feel guilty. All right, so um, you want to know who's food feel worse? Do you know how many temples I have within an hour of my house? Six. I have six temples within an hour of my house. All right. He saves up his money. He goes to the temple every six months. This is one of his visits to the temple. He sits down, 
and he sits in one of the lobbies, you guys will know when you go, sits in one of the lobbies, a little chapel, waiting for a session to start, and this man sits down next to it. And being a fully Mormon person, he is nice. <laughs> and he's like, hi, who are you? And the man says, well, he said, where are you from? You know, you would do this, right? Hey, how are you guys doing? Where are you guys from, right? Normal conversation, where are you from? The man said, I'm from Secondi. John said, oh, I'm from Secondi. I, I lived in Secondi for a while. Where did you, uh, where did you live? You, just like you, right? If someone said, I'm from Mesa, you'd be like, oh, what part, right? Maybe it's a little far away, I don't know. You guys were dumb. Where, where are we, Queen, Queen's Creek? <laughs> Queen Creek, Queen Creek. Where's the king? <laughs> All right. You killed him. Okay. He used to be King Creek. <laughs> Sorry. Back to the story. So John, that's those tacos all of a sudden hit my blood. I'm like, I'm feeling pretty good. How are you guys? Uh, John said, where'd you grow up? He said, I, my house is right behind the hospital. Okay. Moved by a growing sense of recognition, the younger man looked at Brother Eko Mensa and asked, what is your name? John Eko Mensa. It's a true story. That is my name too, the younger man replied. 50 years before this happened, John Eko Mensa Sr. had a son had a little boy and a wife. But he had had a disagreement with the matriarch of their village and she banished him. And it was a real banishment. There's nothing he could do. They had, he had to leave the village. He gave his wife and child a hug and was never to see them again. He had to walk, he said, eight hours to find food and then another eight hours to find a place to sleep and another few hours to find a job. And he ended up in a village called Nakaka where he ended up painting people's garages and fences and he was angry and he didn't believe in God and he was mad. Until a woman said, you should come to my church. God believes in you. And he joined the church in 1981. Now you would say, why didn't he get in contact with his family? Number one, he can't or they'll be killed too. There's no postal service. There's no phones. He just lived his life. And he went to the temple every six months. John Eko Mensa Jr. never knew his father. I never knew my father. Right? Sorry, sorry, tacos. All right. Um, he, he never knew his dad. The, the only thing he ever knew about his dad was once his mother had said to him, you, are a, <clears throat> you look just like your father. And she, he said, Mom, tell me more about him. And she said, don't ever speak of that. And then he never did. But in 2004, he was going to the university in opera. And he was sitting down, waiting for his class to start. He picked up a Leahona magazine. It's the enzyme for international. And he said, he started reading the articles. And he liked it. And it said, if you like it, you can keep it. And he was like, sweet. And he stuck it in his bag. And when he got home to his wife, Deborah, they had two kids. He got home to his wife, Deborah. He said, Deborah, I gotta show you this magazine. And Deborah said, I'm telling you, this is a true story. I verified all the facts. Just so you know, you're gonna be like, that's not true, it is true. Deborah said, before you show me your magazine, John, I need to tell you something. I met two young women today. They're missionaries. I really like their message, John. I know you don't like organized religion, but I really like their message, John. I really want to take lessons from them. And he said, oh, Deborah, where are they from? And she said, they're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And he was like, hey, that's who publishes this magazine. And she's like, the magazine, you like it? And he's like, yeah, I love it. She said, will you take the lessons? He said, I will. If they teach this, I'm in. And they were baptized in 2004 and sealed as a family in 2005. And then one morning in October of 2012, John sat up from his bed and thought, Deborah, we need to go to the temple. Now, you might not understand this, but the adults here will. They missed their session, they said, by three minutes. They missed their session, and so they had to wait in the chapel. And as they're waiting in the chapel, an older man came and sat down next to them and said, where are you from?
They said, tears flowed as father and son were reunited. Their joy was compounded by the knowledge that they had each joined the church separately and both found their way to the temple on the exact same morning. Some people would say, that was coincidence. Other Bednar would say, the tender mercies of the Lord are real. He is eager to bestow such gifts upon us. Now, I told sister, oh, I talked to you before you listened to the CDs on the way up to girls camp. Where are you? Klaus, where are you, sister Klaus? I told sister Klaus I would tell the story, so I'm going to hurry and tell this story. This one right here. You can have these experiences with God. These are one-on-one -on -one blessings, and you can have them if you want them. You have to ask for them. God will not intrude on your life. God's never going to walk in your life and be like, I'm in charge now, right? No. If you want these things, you can kneel down tonight and say, uh, so that weird guy tonight said that you like tender mercies. I'm game. <laughs> if you are, right? Notice, by the way, that people who experience this are usually doing his work. They're usually doing his work. They're usually following his plan. Not always, but they're usually trying to do what he would have them do. I want to tell you this story. In John chapter 9, I teach New Testament BYU. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. Most people haven't read this story. There's a blind man. The apostles say, who is man? Who is, who is man? Who is who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus is like, nobody sinned that he was born blind, you idiot. I have that one. Uh, it's, it's, you just sometimes bad things happen to people. That's the way it goes. But I can heal him. And he said, do you want to be healed? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah that'd be kind of nice. So Jesus makes some clay, spits on the ground, makes some clay, puts it on his eyes. And he says, go about a half mile away. Can you imagine? If you're blind. Go about a half mile away to the pool of Siloam, wash, and you'll be, you can be able to see. And the guy's like, deal. So he heads down to the pool of Siloam. This is not how the scriptures go, but this is how I read them in my head. All right. He goes down to the pool of Siloam. Says he washes in the pool of Siloam and received his sight. Then he starts talking to people. He's like, holy cow, I can see. And people like, somebody comes up to him and goes, you know who you look like? You look like that blind guy. And the guy's like, no, it's not him, but it looks like him. And the guy's like, it's me. And they're like, how did you? How did you be able to see? And he said, this guy named Jesus came, put clay on my eyes, told me to wash in the pool of Siloam. I did, and now I can see. And they're like, where is he? He's like, I don't know. I've never seen him. I don't know what he looks like. It's true. You read it, John chapter 9. A little bit different, but this is exactly what happened. Pharisees, bad guys, don't want this guy out there telling people Jesus healed him. So they bring him in, and they're like, who did this to you? And he said, Jesus. And they're like, no, he didn't. And they say, we know that this man, Jesus, this man, you see that verse 24? This man is a sinner. Greatest statement in all the New Testament. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know, I was blind, now I see. Now that is a great moment. Do you think that my wife could say that? If someone came to her and said, your church isn't true, and she would say, whether all these, you know, lies you're giving me are true or not, I don't, I don't know. I don't know everything. But here's what I know. There was a chocolate pie on my doorstep. <laughs> Do you think Aiden, Elaine Dalton, if they said, Joseph Smith's a sinner, she could say, whether Joseph Smith's a sinner or not, I know not. Here's what I know. I have a white rose sitting in a vase in my house. Or if, if Johnny Gomenza, someone said to him, the church isn't true, and he went, I have my son back in my life. What if someone were to come to me? If someone were to come to me and say, Joseph Smith is a sinner, you know what I'd say? I'd probably just quote this guy. Whether Joseph Smith is a sinner or not, I know not. I wasn't there, neither were you. <laughs> then I'd say this, here's what I know. The Book of Mormon changed my life. What are they gonna say? No. -uh. <laughs> well, if you said that to this guy, I was blind, now I see. No. -uh. <laughs> He's like, nope, you want to know how I know that? I was there. I was there for the whole thing. 
We studied this as a class and we came up with a phrase, and this is the one I want you to hear. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an opinion. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an opinion. Someone can come to you and say, I don't believe in God, God is not real, but you've had your own experiences with God. You've seen his tender mercies in your life. A person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an opinion. We're going to finish with this. I know you're wondering, do you matter and does God know you? Now, if I say this, it doesn't matter because I'm Hank and I'm a nobody. But if an apostle who has been set apart for this reason by the Lord himself to tell you this, I promise you it's true. I witness that the Savior knows and is mindful of you. One by one, he knows your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you.